Hello, everyone, and welcome to your Chapter 9 screencast, which is on physical and chemical control of microbes. So we want to really dive into how are we controlling these microorganisms that are within our world. So we need to figure out the degree of exposure we have to them, especially the ones that are potentially harmful to us or pathogenic. Um, which are going to be the most concerning, of course. So we have four major terms in which we use to um, describe the different levels we have of controlling these microorganisms. And that is sterilization, disinfection, decontamination, and antisepsis. So we are gonna talk about each one of those in the coming slides. So first we have sterilization. And in sterilization, this is going to be the process that destroys or removes all viable microorganisms, and this is including our viruses. We're going to usually use this term when we're discussing removing microorganisms from inanimate objects. Um, you can use methods, which we'll get into the details um, in the coming slides, but autoclave or sterilants, such as chemical agents. Um, and we use these different ways to achieve sterilization of surgical instruments and syringes, or we can use it for commercially packaged food, like you see over here, these um, broths worths. So our goal of sterilization is to get rid of bacterial endospores. And We'll touch on endospores a little bit more soon, but we know from previous chapters that endospores are the most resistant and difficult to kill. Um, they're the most resistant to our attempt to control microorganisms, whether it's using chemical agents or antibiotics. So here we are using chemical agents to sterilize some instruments, and um, let's move on to disinfection next. So disinfection is going to be a physical process or a chemical agent to destroy the vegetative pathogen, but not bacterial endospores. So when we talk about the process of specific bacteria able to take their genetic information and create a spore or endospore and kind of go into a dormant phase, that means that they're not really active, they're not vegetative. So they can kind of hang out in really harmful environments until the environment becomes more suitable to their living and then they switch back to their vegetative or active state. So what disinfection does help though is to remove toxins. And we also use this term when we discuss removing um, certain bacteria or pathogens from inanimate objects like food utensils. So you can see here there's a big pot with especially wooden utensils within it to try and get rid of any toxins that have been left behind. Um, we can also use uh, iodine solutions for uh, thermometers. So if you are, uh, let's say, taking a temperature on one patient, you can use an iodine solution to um, remove any toxins on the thermometer and then use it for the next patient. Um, you can also use bleach. So you can disinfect an examining table like you see over here at the bottom. Next we have decontamination or sanitization. And here this means that we use a cleansing technique that mechanically will remove microorganisms as well as other type of debris to reduce the contamination to safe levels. And this is used in restaurants, um, dairies, breweries, any place that is going to have soiled utensils or containers. So we have this Clorox antibi anti antibacterial soap here. And we also have a different type, type of soap called asepsia. And we can use it on cooking utensils, dishes, cans, um, by using these soaps or detergents or any other commercial dishwashers that we would use. And then the last type we have here is antisepsis, and this is also called degermination. And this is when you are 
talking about reducing the number of microorganisms on human skin. So when our surgeons go in for surgery, they go through this decontamination process on their living tissue, their skin. So they're going to scrub their skin um, or immerse it in specific chemicals in order to reduce as many microorganisms as they can. You, they can also use alcohol and um, they can use like a brush to get under their nails as well that we would call that mechanical friction um, to scrub down their their hands and we can also use some iodine here too um, you could see at this on this top portion this top image to the right to reduce the number of microorganisms on the skin during surgery so our primary targets of microbial control are going to be these microorganisms that are uh, allowed to cause infection within our body or spoilage within our environment or on our human body. And like I said, bacterial endospores are going to be the most resistant as far as all of our bacteria here and viruses and fungi as well. And protozoans, forgot to talk about those guys there. So we see that the easiest ones or the least resistance are going to be these enveloped viruses. We have gram-positive bacteria, non-enveloped viruses, fungi, gram-negative bacteria, then protozoan, and um, specific staphylococcus and pseudomonas. Mycobacterium, remember they carry that um, mycolic acid that waxiness to it that makes it a little bit more difficult to get rid of and then we have our bacterial endospores and then one we haven't talked about are prions prions are going to be a class of their own um, they cannot sterilize prions by the discussed procedures um, in the previous slides or for the rest of this chapter really but they are resistant to heat and chemicals um, but we can try and use a combination of these agents to try and achieve sterilization. But it's very difficult to do. And the CDC, which stands for the Centers of Disease and Control and Prevention, they have to be contacted if there's anything contaminated by these prions so that they can give you specific instructions to sterilize them. And the next thing we're going to talk about are agents versus processes. So when we use sterilization and disinfection, these are processes to get rid of uh, microorganisms. And we have a couple different terms um, to, to talk about the different levels of agents that we can use to get rid of microorganisms. So the first one is bactericide, and this is going to be a chemical that is going to destroy the bacteria except for those at the endosphere stage, the most resistant stage. So what I have pictured here as an example is um, stems from a, a pea snap, and they have been infected with bacteria here. So we can use um, this special spray here, the prosidic that is going to help prevent that. So that would be our chemical um, bactericide that will destroy the bacteria. And then we have fungicide, which is gonna be a chemical that can f kill fungal spores. So I have an example of this too, where pictured is a bunch of wood chips and we have some fungi growing within these wood chips. So we can also use the spray on these um, fungal spores here to get rid of them. So we would call that a fungicide as well. And then next we have verucide, and this is going to be a chemical known to inactivate viruses, especially on living tissue. So we have specific, it's called verucide. So you have it right there. Sporicide is going to be an agent capable of destroying bacterial endospores. So this is some really strong um, chemicals that we have here in order to do this. This is also going to be sterilant because it destroys the most resistant microbes, our endospores. And then our germicide or microbicide is going to be the chemical agents that kill microorganisms. So this is more of a general term that we use, kind of like an umbrella term. Um, and here are some examples that you're used to seeing like Pine Sol, Lysol, and Clorox. 
So more on agents and processes. Um, these next three terms can be confusing. You can easily mix them up. So let's kind of point out what you can really identify as the difference between these three terms. So first we have sepsis, and this is when we have a growth of microorganisms in the blood or other tissue. So here we have our bloodstream, and we could see that the blue is representing the bacteria that have entered our bloodstream. The red would be our red blood cells. So this um, difference here is that we have an infection or growth within the blood or other tissues. Whereas asepsis, this is a practice that is preventing the entry of infectious agents into sterile tissues and thus prevents infection. So that A in there meaning without, so without the growth of microorganisms in blood and other tissues. Uh, we also have uh, an aseptic technique and you guys as surgical technicians are always going to use aseptic techniques. Um, because you're going to practice this within healthcare, and it ranges from sterile methods to antisepsis. So, what is antisepsis, antisepsis or antisepsis? And this is going to be using our chemical agents to apply directly to exposed body surfaces, so like the skin or our mucous membranes, wounds, and surgical incisions to prevent vegetative pathogens. Remember that that means more active pathogens. So I like this image because it kind of shows you the areas that we make sure are sterile here. Um, we are going to use this technique um, or chemical agent rather to prepare the skin before we surgically cut into the body using iodine compounds. So whenever you see somebody being prepped for surgery, you see this brown, um, brown, uh, it's not like a gel, but brown liquid that is put on over the area that they are going to uh, make an incision into. Um, that would be the iodine compound. You'll also see during an open root canal that they will swab the area with hydrogen peroxide or just everyday hand washing with a germicidal soap will be a type of antiseptic. So we want to talk about uh, the difference between these terms and the ones we just learned. So before we do that, let's talk about stasis and static. Both of these mean to stand still. And when we take this into uh, the different types of microorganisms that we have, it means that we are going to retard or slow down the growth. So when we use the term bacteriostatic, that means that we use some type of chemical agent that will prevent the growth of bacteria on tissues or on objects in the environment. So I like this image up here because it shows you the difference. Here's bacteria static and we have our bacteria here and their hands are kind of tied, right? So they're not going to be able to progress or grow as well as they would if they were free. And we have some examples here that we talked about in uh, chapter 10. And then bactericidal, and I always like to think of this cidal as kind of like suicidal, even though they're not committing suicide, but they're dying. So it kind of makes me remember that. We can see that all the bacteria are dead over here. And we have examples that we discussed in chapter 10 listed here on the side for you too. So our, um, our example that we're going to talk about in this chapter though is bacteriostatic water. And this is sterile with benzyl alcohol that is added to prevent bacteria from growing within the water, making it safe for multiple injections. Unfortunately, the bacteriostatic water is at a shortage right now, so you need to make sure to choose a reputable company in order to purchase this bacteriostatic water. And really they use this to kind of mix with other um, chemical agents for various procedures that you, um, you need within healthcare. So we also have the term, term fungostatic, and this is going to be a chemical that inhibits fungal growth. So I want you to keep in mind as we're using these terms, these antiseptics and drugs often have a microbistatic effect because the microbicidal compound can be very toxic to human cells. So again, that the ending cidal means we're killing almost everything. Even if we use that ending, the cidal, C-I-D-A-L, 
that doesn't necessarily mean that we have complete sterilization. It depends on how it's used. Um, so static, think kind of like you are just minimizing the growth, retarding the growth. Cidal, you are trying to kill as much as possible. Now when it comes to microbial death, this means we have permanent termination of an organism's vital processes. And our microbes don't really have any vital processes, so it's difficult to tell if there's true death. So what we use as um, a way to tell whether we have microbial death is if they still have reproductive capability. So if we're seeing that there's no more growth really occurring, then that is going to be our definition of microbial death. Now we have some factors that are going to affect death rate. We have um, and uh, we have this whole population of microorganisms, and it's not going to be an instantaneous death. It's going to kind of happen over time, which is exponential. So you can kind of see the chart that we have here, a log number of bacteria versus time, and we see that there is a decline taking place here. Um, that is going to show us that the active cells are tending to die more quickly, rather than less metabolically active cells. And eventually we have a point where there's survival that is unlikely amongst these microorganisms. And we take that point and say it's equivalent to sterilization. So let's look at these factors. We have number of microbes that will be in effect here. So if we have a higher load of contaminates, it takes longer to destroy. So if we take a look at this chart here, we can see if we have a higher population load that that even though we have that um, logarithm of death taking place, it's going to end all take us more time to get rid of that population versus having a low population load here. Then we have the nature of microorganisms in the population. And this is a target population that usually is a mixture of bacteria, fungi, spores, and viruses. We're not just talking about bacterium alone. We have to take into account all the microorganisms in the environment. And then we have temperature and pH within the environment, and we talked about that in Chapter 6, so I won't elaborate on that. Um, next, we have concentration or dose or intensity of an agent. And this is going to be UV radiation because it's the most effective. So if we look at our, our uh, schematic here of wavelengths, we can see ultraviolet light takes place between 100 nanometers and 400 nanometers. And like we said, at 260 nanometers, this is going to be the uh, most effective at uh, creating microorganism uh, or microbial death. And most disaffectants are going to be more active at higher concentrations. So again, it kind of def depends on what you're using the agent on, whether you can use that higher concentration. But if it's an inanimate object that the agent isn't going to cause harm effect, you want to go for that higher concentration. And then we have our mode of action of our agent. Um, and this is really asking, how does it kill or how does it inhibit the microorganism? So what we want to target are cellular components. And I have a range listed here for you, the cell wall, cell membrane, cellular synthetic processes, and proteins. So first, let's talk about them as a whole. The least selective agents tend to be more effective against the, oh, what just happened here? Okay, I don't know why that just popped up. Sorry, guys. This is the issue with technology. Okay, so when we use, for example, heat and radiation, we have these serving as less selective agents so that we can be effective against the widest range of microbes. Whereas when we use drugs, we are using more, or this is serving as more of a selective agent uh, to target single cellular components. So this kind of reminds us of antibiotics, how we have a broad range and 
uh, or excuse me, narrow spectrum and broad spectrum. It's kind of that. So our heat and radiation would kind of be like our broad spectrum because it can kill against the widest range of microbes, whereas our drugs, it's only a specific range. All right, so next um, we're going to go into detail a little bit more about each of these cellular components. How does it really use these chemical agents or physical agents to get rid of these cellular components? So if we discuss our cell wall, this means that we're blocking the synthesis, the creation of the cell wall, or we are trying to digest the cell wall with a specific chemical detergent or alcohol. When it comes to the cell membrane, we want the agent to bind to the lipid membrane, which allows chemicals to enter the cell and ions to enter and exit. So this kind of messes up the uh, conformation of the cell membrane, which can lead to lysis. And we can use detergents to do that. And then we have our cellular synthetic processes. So when we talk about this, really we're talking about our ribosomes and their process of creating proteins or protein synthesis. Um, and we need that in order for the microorganism to grow. But of course we wanna halt this. So what we can do is disrupt that these ribosomes from going through with protein synthesis, and we can also change the genetic codes using uh, chemical agents like formaldehyde, radiation, and ethylene oxide. And then we have our proteins, and once again, we need our proteins in order for these microorganisms to work properly. So what we do is use certain alcohols or um, phenols to denature the protein and denature kind of means like you're breaking apart bonds and um, disrupting the protein so it's not really active it can't really do its job we're inhibiting the action and we can do this by attaching the chemical agent to the active site or we can um, use moist heat in order to disrupt and dis denature the proteins as well all right, and then our last thing is going to be the presence of solvents interfering organic matter and inhibitors. And this is when we have saliva, blood, and feces that can inhibit the action of the disinfectant and even the action of the heat. Oh, I forgot to touch upon the surfactants on the cell membrane. So this is just showing you how these chemical agents are going into the cell membrane and disrupting it, creating these holes or pores, allowing the chemical agent or water um, from the surrounding environment to move inside the cell, ions to move out, disrupting the whole process. All right, so here is a concept check. The use of iodine compounds to prepare the skin for surgery is known as, we have A, disinfection, B, antisepsis, C, sterilization, and D, sanitization. And the answer is, if you said B, antisepsis, you are correct. All right, so next we have our methods of physical control, specifically heat. So whenever we use these elevated temperatures, we are going to create a microbial cytal um, agent. And if we use lower temperatures, then we're still killing some microorganisms, but not all of them, we're just kind of halting growth. So we can call this microbiostatic. And the higher temperature, that a microorganism is exposed to, the shorter time that we're going to need in order to sterilize that, that thing, that inanimate object or whatever it is. So let's talk about our two different types of heat. We have moist heat in which we can use hot water or boiling water or steam between 60 and 135 degrees Celsius. This is going to operate at lower temperatures and shorter, shorter exposure times to achieve the same effectiveness as dry heat, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then we have a microbial effect that is the coagulation or denaturation process of uh, proteins. 
So to describe this, I want you to look at this image on the right where we're talking about denaturing proteins within an egg. When eggs are cooked at a high heat like 100 degrees Celsius, the proteins are going to squeeze together causing the water within the protein bonds to be pushed out and the egg mixture becomes this curdled looking like thing. Um, so we can see in this image that the proteins or the amino acid, which we know the amino acids all bonded together are creating our proteins, they're heated up and they create a network supported by water and they become too hot and shrink and the water is pushed out of the network. So that's what we're seeing at number four there. Uh, when it comes to dry heat, we are using hot air on an open flame, which is going to range anywhere from 160 to 1000 degrees Celsius. This is going to dehydrate the cell, which removes the water, and they need that water for metabolic reactions or chemical reactions within the cell. So what happens is we're denaturing the proteins here. This is going to increase the stability of some protein conformations, so that means we have to go to even higher temperatures to um, destabilize those protein conformations or shapes. At very high temperatures, we start to oxidize cells, which causes them to burn into ashes. So here is going to be some examples of moist heat methods. So first we have our boiling water. And our boiling water can disinfect or decontaminate items at home or in a clinic. But we can't sterilize because some are going to be resistant and make it through that 100 degrees Celsius temperature. Boiling materials for around 30 minutes are going to kill most of the non-endosphore uh, forming pathogens. But most of the items are going to become easily recontaminated anyway when you remove it from the water. So um, this is a good method, but it's not the best. Then we have pasteurization, which we've talked about already in, I believe it was chapter two. This is gonna disinfect beverages such as milk, fruit juices, beer, and wine. And the heat will be used to reduce the microbial load and destroy the pathogens while retaining taste and food value. We need special heat exchangers. You can see one of these pictured to the right here. Um, and there's two different methods that you can use. There's the flash method and the batch method. And you use different temperatures and time exposures for each of these. But they do say that the flash method, method is preferred to maintain the flavor and the nutrition of whatever you're trying to pasteurize. Unfortunately, through this process, you can't kill endospores. So microbials are still present within, uh, let's say, the milk that you are trying to pasteurize, um, which kind of explains even though you don't open a milk carton, it can still spoil if it's unopened because the microorganisms in there can still grow over time, spoiling the milk. And then we have autoclaving. We actually have an autoclave within our um, microbiology lab. And this is when we're gonna use steam under pressure. So the water is gonna boil and then we change it from liquid into a gas at 100 degrees Celsius. And what we do within this autoclave machine is we're going to increase the pressure. And when we increase the pressure, that increases the temperature. So an average time that you're going to autoclave something is about 20 minutes and the pressure should be set at about 15 PSI, which gives you around a 121 degree uh, temperature to sterilize. And we could compare this to a pressure cooker that you have maybe at home. Um, we're just changing the pressure in there, so that is gonna change the temperature and cause um, you to be able to cook that food faster. Or in our case, in autoclaving, we are going to um, get rid of microorganisms that way. So what do we use this for? We use it for glassware, cloth, like surgical dressings, um, metallic instruments, liquids, paper, some media, and heat resistant plastics. If we use dry heat methods, we have an incineration in a flame or hot in a hot air oven. So when we discuss incineration, this means that we can reach 
around 1,870 degrees Celsius at its hottest point, but we have incinerators that can range from 800 to 6,500 degrees Celsius, and our microbes are going to turn into ashes and gas. So we um, are going to limit this to metals and heat resistant glass. Typically in a microbiology lab, you would use a Bunsen burner to do this on your inoculating loops or needles that you would use. However, it is dangerous um, because first of all, as an operator, you have that open flame. So, um, you know, you can burn yourself or catch something on fire. And also we can't really contain the bacteria or any other microorganisms that are on your inoculating loops or needles from going into the air. And that's why typically in our lab, we're going to use alcohol to fix bacteria to the slides instead of using a Bunsen burner. So if we did have a tabletop infrared incinerator, which you see pictured here to the right, that's what we could use within our lab, but we just don't have one. So we'll use the alcohol. And then for the hot air oven, this is also known as a dry oven, it coils, the coils within it, sorry, are going to radiate heat within an enclosed compartment. So our sterilization will take place at 150 to 180 degrees Celsius for about two to four hours. And this helps to destroy endospores. So we use this for glassware, metallic instruments, powders, oils, and you want to avoid using it on materials that will burn at high temperatures like paper, cotton, or plastic. So what do we do if we have heat resistance taking place here? Um, we have our bacterial endospores. We said that these have the greatest resistance and destruction of the spores usually are going to require temperatures above boiling. Um, so we do say that these have the greatest resistance, but the resistance also varies. So sometimes we're able to get rid of some spores, but not all of them. And then we talked about vegetative cells already as well. These are going to vary in sensitivity to heat, but usually when we have a uh, cell that is vegetative in its active form, we're going to be more easily able to, um, to get rid of it, to use some type of agent to kill it. And it doesn't matter if we have a vegetative cell that can form a spore or it's just a regular bacteria cell that can't form a spore. They're going to have that same susceptibility to heat that the uh, vegetative cells that can form spores have. So they're kind of on the same playing field is what I'm trying to say. Um, and whether a microorganism organism is a pathogen to our body, our body, our body or not, it's going to have the same susceptibility once again. And fungi, protozoa, and wor worms are also going to have a similar type of sensitivity to heat as well. Now, when it comes to viruses, they are resistant to heat. So they have a pretty high tolerance that will extend from 55 degrees Celsius for about two to five minutes to 60 degrees Celsius for 600 minutes. So we have two uh, thermal death measurements. We have our thermal death time, or TDT, and this is going to be the shortest length of time required to kill all test microbes at a specified temperature, whereas our thermal death point or TDP is going to be the lowest temperature that we need to kill all the microorganisms in a sample in 10 minutes. So here we see a chart that kind of shows us the different types of uh, microorganisms that we have and at what temperature we can get rid of or kill um, these microorganisms. Now we're going to get into our effects of cold and desiccation. So our principal benefit of using this cold treatment is to slow down the growth of cultures and, micro, uh, and microbes in our food during processing and storage. So the cold is really just stopping or slowing down the activities of most of the microbes. And most of the microbes aren't going to be adversely affected by us gradually cooling them or keeping them 
refrigerated for long periods of time or using a deep freezer. And the temperatures are going to be from negative 70 degrees Celsius to 135 degrees Celsius, which if you aren't um, the best at knowing um, or translating this over to Fahrenheit, it's going to be about negative 95 degrees Fahrenheit to negative 211 degrees Fahrenheit. And that can preserve cultures of bacteria, viruses, and fungi for long periods of time. So let's talk about each um, type of cold preservation, let's say. Um, so first we have desiccation, and this is going to be when we have our vegetative cells directly exposed to normal room temperature and then gradually become dehydrated. So you can see this process on the right hand side here. They kind of shrink in size and some microbes are going to be killed by this desiccation process. On others it has no effect so it just kind of depends on what the microbe is. Then we have lyophilization, and this is going to be a combination of freezing and drying. We have one of these mechanisms over on the right hand side um, to do this. And we preserve the microorganisms in their viable state for many years. Our pure cultures are frozen instantaneously and exposed to a vacuum that's going to remove the water, avoiding the formation of ice crystals. And then we get to radiation. Radiation itself is energy that's going to be emitted from atomic activities and it's dispersed at high velocity through matter or space. So, excuse me. So when you look at this chart on the right hand side, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse here or not, but when we discuss radiation, this is going to be everything from the gamma rays to x rays to UV radiation. So we break this down into two types of radiation. We have ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation. When we talk about ionizing radiation, we're going to use our gamma rays and x-rays. So I want to draw your attention to the right middle image here that says ionizing radiation. We have our atom and within it we have our electrons circling the nucleus which our nucleus is where we find our protons and neutrons, right? So when we do ionizing radiation, it's causing us to move over these electrons. We're switching, um, maybe taking electrons from one atom, transferring it to another. So we do this to sterilize materials sensitive to heat or, ke uh, or chemicals and items are placed in a machine for a short amount of time at specific dosages depending on what it is in order to, um, to sterilize them. To, um, when we do this process the dosage is going to be measured in grays and this can range from 5 to 50 kilograys. I mean you can get radiation, I know it sounds crazy if you haven't heard this before, but you can get radiation just from sleeping next to somebody. And I mean it's a very very low radiation but um, there's radiation there. Every time you fly, you're exposed to radiation. So it's kind of all over um, our world. And the, are the gamma rays, at the gamma ray level, I should say, that's the type of ray that's going to penetrate materials the most. And we go through this process of um, irradiation when we want to use radiation to kill bacterial pathogens, insects, worms, and inhibit sprouting of white potatoes. So we're really using it for our food. Um, you can see this on the bottom right picture where we show some strawberries that haven't been, um, uh, they, they didn't use the ionized radiation, they used non-irritated, that's what they call it. Um, and then on the right side you see that we have our ionized radiation taking place and the strawberries have lasted longer. They haven't molded or anything like that. So um, it's safe to use on food and the food itself is non-radioactive. Um, the only danger that we see doing this process is danger to the operators that are exposed to the radiation. Um, of course they take the proper precautions to reduce that danger or exposure. Um, we can also use this for drugs, vaccines, medical instruments, uh, syringes, surgical gloves, and tissues such as bone, skin, and heart valves for grafting. 
Now when it comes to non-ionizing radiation, we use our UV radiation, which we said can range from 100 to 400 nanometers, but the most lethal is going to be 260 nanometers, or you can pick a range from 240 to 280 nanometers. This isn't as penetrating as ionizing radiation. It really only passes through air, slightly through liquid, or, um, and poorly through solids. So it's difficult to sterilize using this method. So we use it more for disinfection rather than sterilization. We can also use germicidal lamps using this UV uh, radiation to reduce airborne microbes. And examples of where we can use these lamps is in hospital rooms to cut down on post-operative infections and transmission of respiratory droplets. Like let's say you sneeze through the air and the, the droplets from you sneezing would be disinfected. Um, we can use it in food preparation to reduce the amount of microbes on food and in slaughterhouses. And we can use it to disinfect water as well. Then we have the process of filtration, and you may already be um, familiar with this from a previous class or a biology class, chemistry class, and this is going to be an effective method to remove microbes from the air and liquids. So we take fluid and strain it through a filter with openings large enough for the fluid to pass but too small for the microbes. So in your book you have this image here. They show you that you have um, your fluid in in this bottle and a vacuum is pulling it down into this beaker and it has to go through this filter in order to make it into the beaker. So we can see all these lines here are representing the pores and we see up on top are all the microbes that we don't want to enter the sterilized fluid. And this is a um, this was a scanning electron microscope image where we see all the little tiny pores and left over we have the bacteria that is not able to move in through those pores. We um, can also use thin membranes of cellulose acetate or polycarbonate and plastics which have um, pore sizes that are carefully controlled to do this. There we go. Um, and other uh, other materials that we can use is charcoal or diatomous earth or unglazed porcelain. And our pore sizes can be controlled to permit true sterilization because we're trapping viruses or large proteins. We can use prepared liquids that can't withstand heat. These are going to be serum that we have, blood products, vaccines, drugs, IV fluids, enzymes, and media. And we can use this as an alternative method for decontaminating milk and beer without altering the flavor. An important step in water purification. Um, we're unable to remove soluble molecules such as toxins that can cause disease though with filtration. Um, so if we have those toxins within the substance we are trying to sterilize, filtration is not the answer here. And then we have HEPA filters or high efficiency particulate air filters and these are used in hospital rooms and sterile rooms. If someone is um, has a low immune system you want to make sure that they have one of these filters within their room. Next we have osmotic pressure and this is when we add large amounts of salt or sugar to foods to create a hypertonic environment for bacteria causing plasmolysis. And uh, we talked a little bit about these hypertonic environments in chapter six. So the way we do this is by pickling certain foods. So you can see this over in this region. Plas plasmolysis, by the way, like we said, we're in a hypertonic solution and then water is leaving that cell, causing it to shrink down. So we have pickling or we can smoke certain foods or we can even dry foods out like dried cranberries, we have dried bananas, kiwis here, pineapple and so on. Um, and they've been doing this for centuries to preserve food. Although osmotic pressure is never going to be a sterilizing technique. Alrighty, so next we have our germicidal categories and this is how we are going to have our microbial control take place. 
So our chemical agents can occur within a liquid, gases, or a solid state. And we have a range here from disinfectants and antiseptics to sterilants and preservatives. So they can either be in an aqueous solution, which means we have chemicals that are dissolved in pure water as a solvent, or we have tinctures, which are chemicals that are dissolved in pure alcohol or a water alcohol mixture. So we'll start off with our uh, halogens here. We have chlorine. These can kill endospheres and all other mi uh, microorganisms. They're gonna combine uh, the chlorine with water and it releases a hypochlorous acid. When it does that, it's going to denature the enzymes permanently and suspend any metabolic reactions or chemical reactions within the cell. So we use this to treat wounds, disinfect bedding and instruments, especially if they have been around a sick patient, um, to sanitize food equipment in restaurants, pools, and spas. And then we have iodine, and this also can kill endospores and all other microorganisms. And um, we have this in two different forms. We have free iodine in solution, or we have iodophores, um, which is a combination of iodine and alcohol. Uh, we can use this to penetrate the cells of our microorganisms and interfere with the metabolic function it will start to interfere with the hydrogen and disulfide bonding in proteins, and that essentially is going to later denature or break apart that protein. Next, we have hydrogen peroxide, and this might be something that you have in your home. And this also is going to kill endospores. We have oxygen that is gonna form free radicals. Um, a free radical is going to be a uh, compound that is highly toxic and reactive to other cells. So we can have different chemical reactions take place now um, that could lead to death. Um, you might be wondering too, we use hydrogen peroxide and sometimes we see it bubble up. Um, this is because our blood and living cells are gonna contain an enzyme called catalase and that starts to attack the hydrogen peroxide and converts it into water and oxygen, hence the bubbling. Um, and this has been used as an antiseptic since the 1920s because it's gonna kill bacteria by destroying the cell walls. So it's um, pretty, pretty easy and, um, and good to use. Next we have our aldehydes, and these two are gonna kill endospores and all other microorganisms. So we have two different types that we use, and we have the glutaraldehyde, which is irreversibly going to disrupt act activity of the enzymes and proteins within a cell. This kills quickly, and also it's broad spectrum. So we're gonna be able to kill a majority of the microorganisms that we are trying to get to sterilize or get rid of. Um, so we use this to sterilize many instruments and machines as well. The other type we have is formaldehyde, and this is going to be a sharp, irritating gas. It dissolves in water to form formalin. So I, when I come to class in scrubs, I've probably been in the cadaver lab, and they use formalin to preserve um, the cadavers. So um, that is retarding or slowing down the growth of mold and bacteria and all that within the bodies. Um, it helps to preserve them. And so what the formaldehyde is doing is it's attaching to the nucleic acids and functional groups within amino acids, which we know we find in proteins. It helps to kill more slowly than the glutaraldehyde, um, but we still use it to disinfect surgical instruments, um, although it can be very toxic and irritate skin and mucous membranes. Um, if it's in the form of formalin, it also is a carcinogen and, um, and a teratogen. So meaning you can't be around it when you're pregnant, it will harm the fetus. Carcinogen means that it can cause cancer. And then we have our gaseous, gaseous, gas, gaseous uh, sterilants and disinfectants. And the main one I wanna talk about here is the ethylene oxide, which is going to be a gas. 
This too will kill endospores and all other microorganisms, and it's going to react with the functional groups of DNA and proteins. These functional groups that I'm talking about, it's based on um, more of the chemical compound, and I don't expect you to know the chemical compounds of all these, um, but you should know that the functional group varies or changes um, on each amino acid and parts of the DNA. So that's what we're we're talking about when we say it's reacting with those functional groups. Um, so when it does that, it's going to block DNA replication and also enzymatic actions. Hence, we're not going to be able to reproduce and cause growth. Um, it's used to disinfect plastic materials and delicate, delicate instruments. It's also explosive, so it has to be combined with carbon dioxide and fluorocarbon um, to prevent that. It can also damage the lungs, eyes, and mucous membranes if it's contacted directly, so it can be um, kind of dangerous to use because you don't want to irritate any of those structures. And this too is also a carcinogen, meaning it can cause cancer. Then we have our phenol or uh, carbolic acid. This is going to kill some bacteria, viruses, and fungi. It's derived from distillation of coal tar, and it's kind of used as a cellular poison. So if you use it in high concentration, it's going to disrupt the cell walls and membranes and proteins. If you use it in low concentration, it inactivates certain critical enzymes that is needed for um, metabolic reactions. It's typically used in limited cases like drains or cesspools and animal quarters. It can be dangerous to use, so it's kind of limited to just those things. Then we have the chlorhexidine, and this is going to kill most bacteria, viruses, and fungi, and targets the bacterial membranes. It will cause denaturation of proteins once again, and this is because of the, um, the ability for the membrane to have that selective permeability is lost, so the proteins are broken down and anything can now enter or exit the cell. And it's usually used in prepping skin before surgery. Next we have alcohol. This is going to kill most bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Um, the compounds that you see to the right here are ethyl and isopropyl alcohol, ethyl being the two carbons here and the propanol being one, two, three over here. Um, they are going to be the most suitable for antimicrobial control. That's what we use within our lab as well. And if you use a concentration of 50% or more, the uh, alcohol is going to dissolve the membrane lipids It'll disrupt the cell surface tension and compromise membrane integrity. And it's usually used as a skin deserming agent. Okay, and the last germicidal um, agents that we're going to talk about are detergents and heavy metal compounds. So for detergents, these are going to kill some bacteria, viruses, and fungi and they act as surfactants. So we can break them down into two categories. We have the anionic detergents, which have limited microbial power, and we have cationic detergents, which are going to be our effective antimicrobials. So again, um, depending on what type of charge they have, that's what type of detergent category they will fall under. What they do is they disturb the cytoplasmic or cell membrane, and we are um, going to lose permeability by doing that, and eventually we'll have microbial death take place. We are going to use these detergents to clean restaurant utensils and dairy equipment and restrooms as well. Now when it comes to our heavy metal compounds, these will kill some bacteria, viruses, and fungi like our detergents. They're going to contain inorganic or organic metal salts and bind to functional groups of proteins and inactivate them. So again, those functional groups vary on each amino acid, and that's kind of what separates each type of amino acid from one another. 
We are going to use this in preservatives and cosmetics so that bacteria or other microorganisms aren't growing within the uh, cosmetic products. Also the ophthalmic solutions um, that we use for the eyes. And they can be toxic if inhaled, ingested, or absorbed. Okay, so this is a figure from your book here. Um, it just kind of shows you what the, the protein conformation is. So we have the native state, which is the functional active state. Um, we have a active site on this protein, which is where the substrate is attached to. Um, so we can have chemical agents attached to that area and um, cause these different things to happen in B, C, and D. So at, in B, what we see is complete denaturation. That means they're breaking apart um, bonding and nothing is attaching to one another. We just have long strands of repeating amino acids here. Um, in B, we see that we have Oh, I'm sorry, in C, we see that we have a different conformation or a different shape here. That means that the bonding we, is still in place, but it's not the correct bonding. And so it's changing the shape of the protein. It has kind of folded incorrectly upon itself. And D, we have the blocked active site. Like we said, we can use a, a chemical agent that is going to attach to the active site and that will stop the protein from working properly. And lastly, I believe this is our last slide, we have um, the structure of what a detergent is. All of those R's that you see in on the top um, compound, that's representing different functional groups. These are going to be polar molecules, meaning certain areas are going to have more of a, a positive charge, certain areas are going to have more of a negative charge. So usually we have a positive head and one long uncharged hydrocarbon chain. Hydrocarbon chain means that we have, um, for example, down in here, we have carbon and N means it could be any number. So let's say this is C2. So that means I have two carbons and then the H we have two times two, so four. So our carb we have two carbons attached with four hydrogens attached to those carbons. Um, and then we have a central nitrogen nucleus here, also in this, and various al alkyl uh, groups. So this would be like our main functional group over here. This is the one that is really going to change um, from detergent to detergent. So a little bit, you can kind of think of it as being similar to amino acids, although they have three components that will stay the same all the time, and their functional group will be the only thing that changes. Um, if that's still confusing to you, we can discuss this um, in the beginning or after class too when I see you guys on Tuesday. And then in B, what we see is a common quaternary ammonium detergent. Um, it's just an example of what we can place at each one of these R's, each one of these um, variable sites. So that is it. Um, don't forget to take your practice exam too and let me know if you have any questions at all and you will be taking your exam on Tuesday on chapter 6 and this chapter 9 that we just covered. Have a great rest of your break and I will see you soon.